Welcome to our cabin. My name is Eric. And my name is Ariel. We have been living off grid for just over four years. This is our property and it is three and a half acres and we have a 320 square foot cabin. When we first moved in, this cabin was considered a dry cabin. So what that means is there is no running water nope. in the cabin. And in fact, there was no running water on the property. We're not just going to be showing you inside the cabin today. We're also going to be doing a little bit of a property tour, which is pretty neat. When we first moved up here, we had no experience at all with living off grid. So it was definitely a learning curve for us. And if you're not familiar with what that means, is it just really means there's not city utilities available to you. So specifically power, water and plumbing. When we arrived, we had to just immediately start thinking about what we were going to do to accommodate those needs for us. There's no right or wrong way to living off grid and being in Alaska has given us a ton of freedom on how we wanna do it. Absolutely, and over the years, we've actually been very fortunate to meet other folks who are off grid and kind of learn from them, see their systems. We felt it would be fun to share with you <laughs> what our lifestyle has been like and it has, has changed a little bit throughout the years. We don't have a perfect system by any means, but there's a lot of really like cool things about Alaska, I call it Alaska. Alaska ingenuity, you will see folks do some really neat stuff because of the climate and because of the freedom and I guess creativity. Without further ado, let's get you guys into the cabin. Well, this is it and this is also Pepper. Let's put her down. <laughs> so it is, this first floor is 320 square feet. As Eric mentioned, we happen to have a half loft which adds an additional 160 square feet, which is absolutely awesome. It's one big room. You can kind of get a feel for it. Pretty simple if you just do a spin. So there's no sections or anything like that. And there is no bathroom. You may notice that as well. We have changed the layout just a little bit since when we first arrived. I think we feel like it is pretty cozy in here now. A little bit limited on space, but still cozy nonetheless. And this place was not completely finished when we purchased it. The floor had not been completely done. So Eric and I did actually put this vinyl waterproof flooring in. We did that the second winter and we absolutely love it. It is awesome. It's really easy for cleaning. We have to sweep in here pretty much on a daily basis. Another really big change that we made, we had a staircase, a spiral staircase leading up to the loft. And it was a very pretty staircase. However, it was not that functional or practical because it did take up a lot of space right when you walk in the doorway and it just really it just took up a big amount of space in order to get to and fro upstairs so we changed it over to a ladder it has been working awesome for us we go up there multiple times probably dozens in a day and our cat also likes to go up to the loft so that is why we were not able to have some sort of ladder that folds up or anything like that the area i'm standing although we would love for it to stay open like this most of the time the truth is it is just absolutely not so we have to use our house a lot as a working space uh, we do laundry in here it's our bathroom it's our kitchen it is a workshop for eric many many times and because of the climate and the weather we're actually doing a lot of food processing food preservation and i'll have like food curing in here so i'll even bring tomatoes in here to ripen so i mean this this area usually has things in it it's not open like this before we jump further into things let's talk about the three main things that most folks including us want when you're off grid or you have to you have to deal with so that's the power water and plumbing first we're gonna talk a little bit about power and for Eric and I, I feel like the choice was just very, very simple. We are fortunate to have power fairly close nearby. However, there is a fee to hook it up to your house. So it's not free by any means. And when we looked into that and we also looked into solar, it was actually quite a bit cheaper for solar, surprisingly. So we were able to get a solar system for $2,000 and we have been able to do everything with just generators and that solar system. We love our solar system. I'm gonna have Eric talk a little bit more about that since he's the one who definitely deals with it and does more of the maintenance on a daily basis. Arrow mentioned generators and those are a huge part of our off-grid system. Yes, we do have solar. We have a very small solar system, but in the winter in Alaska, the sun goes down and it barely peaks up during the day. So for us, we use generators to charge up our solar system 
And since we have kind of a small solar system, we also have one big generator that we use for like bigger energy needs. This is the corner of the house where we house most of our solar stuff. This solar system is one of those things that just has been great for us. It hasn't really been problematic. We did have one problem with our inverter. The company was awesome to work with and they sent us like a brand new upgraded model free of charge. But the solar panels are outside. We have two 300 watt panels. The batteries actually used to be inside. I think for about a week and then we learned about off gassing on lead acid batteries so the batteries have been moved outside into an insulated box and early on i think within like the first couple of months we decided that two batteries just was not enough so we went and got two more so we have four six volt batteries and those are wired for a 12 volt system and that's what our inverter is over here and this inverter and our charge controller mounted on the wall is kind of semi-permanent. We've always wanted to kind of clean things up a little bit, but we just haven't done it. But it works perfectly good for us. We have a small inverter. This is a Xantrax 2000 watt inverter, and I think it can handle uh, heavy loads up to like 4000 watts. So this is what actually hooks to the batteries and converts the battery power to actually like a plug in a house. So there's a wire that comes out of here. It goes into the control box of our house, and we just got regular lights and plugs it functions pretty much like a normal house over here is the charge controller so the solar panels have a wire that's dug in the ground all the way over our connex they run underneath the house into the charge controller and it basically tells the solar panels how much power to give to the batteries to charge them and that wire goes out and hooks out to our batteries these things are meant to be mounted inside that's why we have them over here in the corner of our house keep them out of the elements and we can always just come over and we can see how our batteries are doing. A couple cons about this system is the size of it. So I mentioned before, it's a 2000 watt inverter. It's pretty small, so we can only run certain things off of it. And one other thing, I don't know if it's a con, but it's something to be aware of. This particular inverter, when it's hot, or if something heavy kicks on like a freezer, or if it's charging from the generator, there's two fans on the bottom that cool this thing off and they are a little bit loud, but I'm not gonna to complain too much because this system we have has been great and it's a lot better than it was when we first got here. And when we first got here, the only thing we had was a plug on the house and we'd plug a generator in the house and that's how we got our lights back then. I should mention that we don't have that many appliances that draw a lot of energy. So things like a refrigerator, a dryer, a TV and a microwave, we really don't have a lot of appliances at all and i think that's how we're able to get away with such a small solar system is because of our limited energy needs going back to our water when we first moved in there was no water to be found on the property minus the bog outside so eric and i did just bite that one in the bullet pretty much right away i think it was about two months before we had a well put in and as we all know wells are a little bit pricey ours goes close to 200 feet deep and it was about eight grand to put in at the time but it has been money so well worth spent and it has completely influenced how we are able to live our lives here because we have basically unlimited water it's awesome water has a great pressure and all of that the only other really reasonable option was hauling water we didn't really want to do that we looked into it there are some springs where you can go get water and then bring it back to your cabin something that did interest us was harvesting rainwater but that we had to rule out pretty quickly because it does snow here most of the year it doesn't actually rain that much and there is some issues with like burying that stuff you have to bury it deep Otherwise, believe it or not, a big tank above ground would completely freeze in the middle of winter. Our water system is a tad inconvenient and we haven't improved it much, if at all, over the years. And I'm gonna have Eric show you what that looks like. First thing I did wanna mention is the well and it is outside of the cabin. It's about 25 feet that way and it is not hooked to the house at all. So we have a holding tank in our house and this is our holding tank right here. It is pretty small. This is all we could really fit in here. I mean, we could probably go a little bit bigger, but when you fill these things up with water, they're heavy. So this one is 55 gallons. And how I get our water in here is pretty simple. I head out to the well, I hook a garden hose up to it. I run the garden hose through our little cat door. I stick it in the tank, I turn it on and you gotta watch it and make sure it doesn't overfill on you. And then from the tank, we're gonna kind of follow down this little water line here, down to the main part of our water system. And this is semi-unique. These are more meant for like an RV with a 12 volt system. So this is a 12 volt variable speed water pump. And this is cool because it's hooked directly to our battery. So this doesn't go through the inverter at all. And then from there, we kind of just drilled holes through our cabinets. We don't have the nicest cabinets in the world. So the water line goes all the way back along the floor 
and over to the sink. And I should mention that the water line being along the floor kind of poses some threats in the extreme cold. So it's really cold behind those cabinets. And we have had our water lines freeze on us before, but as long as we keep the cabin warm, they seem to be fine. And the sink is, it looks like a normal sink and it functions like a normal sink. So you got your hot water right there. And you got your cold water. So that has a hot water line and a cold water line. Let's jump underneath real quick and see what we're working with. This is it, this is all of our plumbing. And down here we house the water lines that come from the pump. We also have a strictly hot water line. So just hot water goes this, and this is our shower. It's got a little valve to turn it on and off. And we've got like T connections and hoses everywhere, different types of hoses. I mean, it is kind of messy down there. And that's probably one thing I would do different with our water system if I was ever gonna redo it. I would probably do like PEX pipe. Uh, all we did for this one was like a thin rubber hose that they sell at Home Depot. So I'd probably change that. It is a pretty big improvement from what was here when we originally moved in. So there was nothing here. And this is 30 inches right here. So this was actually meant for a stove or an oven, but ours is 20 inches. So we keep it over there and we put in the sink and we used to just have a five gallon bucket here that the sink would just drain into. And it works, you know, when it gets full, you dump it outside. The problem is you're not paying attention and it can overfill on you. And it did that. So that didn't last very long. What we did was we drilled a hole out the back of the cabin. So now the sink goes down the drain, drains out the back of the cabin. It's awesome because if you ever have like a clog in your pipes, I mean, we have like two feet of pipe, so it's easy to get the clog out. When the water comes out of our holding tank, that is ice cold Alaskan well water. So it is not hot yet. Let's go over to our water heater and we can show you how we get our hot water. Our water lines continue from the sink along the wall underneath Bo's dog bed, and they come up to our propane on-demand water heater. So you have the cold water going in, this converts it to hot water, you have your hot water coming out, and you got your propane line. This is a Camp Lux water heater. I think it's like their 10L model or something like that. It's, we've had it for since we've put our water system in. So we've had it for four and a half years. I really like it. I have had a couple little issues with fittings in there and a lot of it was actually covered by warranty. So they sent me new parts for it. And this is more meant for like an RV or like an outdoor shower. It doesn't require any electricity, which is awesome for us. It uses two D batteries for the igniter. And as soon as this feels water coming through it, it automatically will light and the propane burners in there will heat your water and shoot your hot water out for you. Being that this is like for outdoors, us having it indoors, it probably should be vented. It is not vented right now. And we didn't want to drill a hole in the side of the cabin. We don't usually run it for very long at all. The longest times we'll run it is we're doing laundry. But at that point, we'll just crack the window open right here and it's never been a problem for us. And speaking of cracking the window open, this is where we shower. So that shower head that was underneath the sink, it gets pulled over here and it right through here and hung up in our shower. And showering here is a two person job. So one person will go out there with the shower head to take their shower. The other person will turn on the little valve for them and then they'll come over here and they'll make their adjustments depending on how hot you want the water out there. I mentioned that line is just strictly hot water. So the temperature that it comes out of the hot water heater here is the temperature you're gonna get there in the shower. It's in Celsius, so we had to get used to that, but honestly, it's pretty simple. We just barely have to touch it and we get an awesome shower. And who doesn't love a nice hot shower outdoors in Alaska? Let's move on to the bathroom and kitchen. Our plumbing and sewage is very straightforward and simple, and that is because we do not have one really. We don't have a gray water tank and we also do not have any sort of septic system. We have an outhouse outside. This is my little bathroom nook and I have a mirror. I usually take this down when we're filming, a face towel. I also have our toothbrushes too on the counter. This is where they usually stay. Uh, Eric makes fun of me when I put those away, but I just like to like clean up because it's a little strange to have a bathroom and a kitchen mixed, even though that's how we've been living for the last four years. And honestly, this is really my station. I don't find Eric much over here. So it's usually just me. I use the sink too over here for my bathroom needs. The sink is awesome in our kitchen. It's a deep, big sink. So it works really well for canning and cleaning pots. The kitchen's straightforward. We've got some shelving that we put up right when we got here. We've got a little L-shaped countertop and this big table, which is a great workspace. We do a lot of canning, preserving, just all of that in here. And we love to cook and it works for us. I know it's small, but it's just awesome 
and we've been able to do a lot in here. The biggest issue really is food storage and also including temperature of food storage. So it's really hot in our cabin, which makes it a little bit difficult to store vegetables or fermented foods. Those are things that I would like to be able to have in here. We do keep all of our canned food in the cabin and it's just kind of stashed throughout the house. The rest of our backup food is stored out in the Connex. And then I have a little bin right here. This is my compost bin. We generate quite a bit of compost and we compost everything that we have. So it stays in here until it's full and then I bring it outdoors. Let's check out the fridge. Here she is. This is just our little ice chest. We've had this for three and a half years. Previously it was a different one and we just have like a lot of our own canned food in here. We obviously put dairy in here too as well. And Eric just puts a jug like this that he freezes and he probably swaps it out maybe every two, three days in the winter. In the summer, we have to swap it out a little bit more. But this system works really well for us. We haven't had any issues with dairy. It's probably not as cold as a true fridge, but again, it works for us. In the winter, it is not hard to freeze these jugs. In the summer, we have to put them in our freezer. Down below is a lot of canned food. And I figured I'd mention this since it gets asked quite a bit is, do we have any issues with earthquakes or do we need protection for earthquakes? We do get a lot of earthquakes living in Alaska. It just hasn't been an issue. I'm sure if we had a really large one, it would probably be an issue, but I'm gonna be honest, these are really strong jars. I have had them fall and they, I mean, it's rare that they break or anything like that. So I'm not too concerned about that personally. Let's head over to something in the kitchen that we use day in and day out. This is our premier stove and oven. Eric mentioned it is 20 inches, so it's a little bit on the smaller side. Dang it, this bad boy gets some major use. There have been many times that we have all four of these fully going and usually the pots are too big. So it works for us though. And we were just trying to save some money back, back when we first bought it. So we went with the smaller one and I can argue we don't really have that much space in here. This works awesome for off-grid setups. It runs off natural gas or propane. We converted it right when we got it. It has two D batteries that it uses to actually ignite or the sparker. So you do not need to have it hooked up to electricity. You know, we don't have that clear little glass window to see what's cooking, but that's okay. Probably one of the most unique things about this stove is when you go to turn on the oven, you actually have to hold the pilot down. I kid you not, probably for like 20 to 30 seconds before it lights. So um, I'm not gonna do it now, but I'm just giving you an example and that is just something to be aware of. It's really not a big deal on my end. We are not very good at monitoring our propane use. We don't have it down to a math or anything like that, but I can tell you we don't use that much propane in our house. The propane water heater, I mean, maybe we change it out two, three times a year. This one is probably closer to every other month. It, we can stretch it a little further sometimes, but when we go into our canning season or the summer, we are using a lot of propane more in here and outdoors. We use quite a bit more outdoors when it is nice out there and we can do the canning out there. All in all, this stove has been awesome. We have had zero issues with it and there's not that many things I can think of off the top of my head that I haven't had a problem with here in Alaska, but this is one of them. This is the section of the house we're gonna call the living room and it is where we can just sit down and relax every once in a while. So you might notice that we have upgraded our couch. So when we first moved in, we bought a used red couch that from day one, we didn't like. It was so uncomfortable. We paid way too much for it. And maybe like six months ago, we found this also used, but in really good condition. Awesome little couch. And I think this is considered a love seat. So it's a little bit smaller, but we're very happy with it so far. This is also a spot where if Ariel and I want to watch a movie or when we upload one of our videos, we want to watch over it. We put our laptop right here. It's got a big 17 inch screen and that's our in-home movie theater. This is also where we hang some of our camera equipment. That's my camera bag, that's Ariel's. And that pretty much does it for the living room. Let's move over to the wood stove. Off grid, so you gotta worry about your heating and your cooling needs. Luckily, we're in Alaska, so we don't need to worry about cooling. We have no AC, anything like that's not necessary, but heating is just like a huge thing. So we have 
a wood stove. And I'm gonna say this is the only heat source for us because it's pretty much the only thing that we use. We have done some work to the area. So first thing we did was we cleaned up our wood stove when we moved in. We took out the metal door and we put in this glass door, which is, it's black right now. And believe it or not, I just cleaned this thing yesterday. So we get a lot of creosote in the stove. I'm constantly cleaning the glass. I like to be able to see the fire at night. We've also done a concrete hearth, which we really like. And we took a try at doing tile and the tile turned out awesome so it's just a really cool area that we can kind of come over and look at the wood stove and this is kind of like a tool for us so not only does it heat the house it also dries our boots our gloves we put our bread over there when it's rising before it goes in the oven we always have a pot of water up here in the winter time and this is called chicken water so in the morning i'll pour a little bit of this warm water in a pail I'll bring out to the chickens, they get their fresh water. We do cook on it sometimes. Like right now I have a pot of water going on here so we can have a second cup of coffee later, but that's not actually gonna heat up to boiling temperature. So I'll have to finish it on the stove. The reason being is we live in a 320 square foot cabin and this stove right here, I'm pretty sure is rated for like over 2000 square feet. So to actually cook on this thing, you need to get it smoking hot. And we can only do that when it's below zero. I'm talking like, negative 15 or 20 outside because if we get this thing ripping right now i kid you not it can get to like 120 degrees up in our loft we've got extra water over here for the chickens and the dogs we've got the dog water bowl i've got kindling if we need to start a fire there's usually chicken food over here just anything that needs a little bit of heat gets put over here this is definitely a multi-use area when we leave let's say overnight or for two nights or for even just a full day and the fire goes out you need to keep the house warm we have canned food in here we have water lines we've got our cat so we don't want anything to happen to the cat what we have is a propane vent free heater and you can go with other options a lot of people around here they'll do like uh oil heat you can get a oil heater that doesn't use electricity you can get one that's really efficient that does use electricity but the cheapest and the easiest was for us just to get this propane vent free heater and it is absolutely awesome it uses no electricity you hook it up to a propane tank it actually has a thermostat on there we usually set it to keep the house at 50 degrees and we have set it we have left our house for five days in the middle of winter and it keeps our house at a constant 50 degrees works absolutely awesome for us today is actually pretty warm it's about 25 degrees outside it's about noon so we're gonna let this fire go out and we'll fire up again tonight we're gonna interrupt our tour to give you an introduction to our friendly critters which you may or may not know by now um this is Bo. <laughs> enough said uh, both of our dogs are close to 13 years in age in fact Bo is probably 13 for sure he is a mixed breed and he is lovely. He's just relaxing on his lay fug bed right now, which is a Tempur-Pedic. He likes this corner because it is quiet and cold. He does not appreciate being by the fire where it's loud and very hot. So we're just gonna let him sleep. This is our black cat. Her name is Pepper, Peppy, or Peppercorn. She has quite a few nicknames and she is shedding right now. I think she's about six to seven. We weren't spot on her age when we got her, but we've had her at a young, from a young age. And she's, she's lovely. She enjoys going outside in the winter. When we moved up here, we had a tabby cat. He passed away a few winters ago and he was not a big fan of Alaskan winters, but Peppy enjoys it up here. She's looking. We've got another sleepy man over here. This is Bandit. He's a Catahoula leopard dog and he is older as well. 13 years, he's just sleeping on his life fuck. He appreciates being by the fire. This is the entrance to our house. Our door opens up this way. So it leaves us with a little bit of a funky space and you go straight up the ladder to the loft. Ideally, we would love to have some sort of like Arctic entry or mud room, but we don't have one and we're very used to not having one. So we have a lot of boots and shoes over here. Eric enjoys wearing flip-flops in the winter. We have our hose, which stays indoors for filling up the storage tank. If we had it outside, it would freeze and it just wouldn't work. So we have to keep it indoors. This little shelf is like for beanies, gloves, books. We've got dog gear over here. We've got some of our bibs and other gear over here too. We also utilize the ladder quite a bit uh, with the little hangers. We store a bunch of our jackets on that. We probably don't have the best system for storage and organization in here. I'm aware of that. We also use the window cells a lot for storing stuff. Right now we have some of the materials that we used when we did the tiling in the wood stove area, but 
Uh, we don't want to store it outside because it will freeze. We're going to head upstairs and show you the loft. Some of you may be wondering what we did with that porcupine that we harvested a while back and he is now in the house looking more beautiful than ever. So that's where he is. <laughs> well, this is it. And it is, like I mentioned, wonderful to have this space. I really can't imagine not having this space here. We have our wardrobe, sleeping arrangements, and a little workspace over there. We've got the Dr. Evil chairs, pretty funny. And we each have a laptop. The sleeping situation is a little funny up here. We used to have a box with some storage that our mattress was on and we were starting to run into some issues with mattresses. Possibly it's because we work so hard and we were having some back issues. I don't quite know. Um, we got rid of that and now the mattress is down on the ground. But I will tell you, I'm just gonna make it a sweet and short story. I looked into hammocks. I got a hammock for Eric and I. We swing for about six months and I'm a true believer in hammocks. It's like the best sleep I've ever gotten. Zero back pain. So we have an extremely awkward situation up here now. And this is really easy to just unhook and throw back up when you want it, but you can probably see how it is just kind of strange and a little cramped up here. We don't have all our clothes in here. A lot of it is out in the Connex. Uh, we just have what we use and we switch it over seasonally. Those on. We've got some lights up here. We rarely use those since they do draw a little bit more energy. Pretty basic up here. It, and honestly, it doesn't actually usually look like this. This is the cleaned up version. Um, just not that long ago, I was doing some packing and it was a hot mess up here. I guess this just really emphasizes how much we think of our bedroom. Um, it's just more of like a workspace for us. So it's really not that pretty. Let's head on back downstairs. The lighting in our cabin is all powered by our solar system and we have all kinds of lights. I'm gonna start at one of my favorites and this is a 12 volt light. So the way this is different is this actually just has a small piece of wire that hooks directly into our batteries. And why that is nice is it doesn't have to go through the inverter and lose power. So these are pretty energy efficient and we got normal house lights in here. We have our kitchen lights, which are up here. We absolutely hate those things. For some reason, they just like break all the time. And I've got them like zip tied and gorilla glued and screwed, and those just need to be replaced. We've got our string lights up top, and we have something called our stage lights. And these are for when we're filming videos in the kitchen. You need to have all kinds of light. So these are like uh, chicken lights for like a, a heat lamp or something. And you just put these on, boom, you light up the kitchen. So we've got one on that side, we've got one over here. And then we also have what was already here in the cabin and that is a fan with three lights up there. I usually only use that in the summertime when we're getting a lot of solar power and I just wanna kinda move air around in here. We also installed a light on our front porch, which is just awesome to have light out there. And another huge energy demand for us is grow lights. So we're not growing plants this spring, but last spring and the one before, we had a massive set of grow lights in here. I'm talking like 12 lights at a time. At that time of the year, it's starting to get where we're getting more sunlight, but we still are having like cloudy, snowy days. So we have to just run the generator a lot to be able to power those lights without draining our batteries too much. As you may know, winter in Alaska can get pretty dark. So let's talk about one of our other main things that we use and that's flashlights. So we have all different kinds of flashlights, headlamps, you name it, we got it. I'm just gonna go over some of my favorites and why. We like rechargeable flashlights. So this is an Olight, this looks pretty small. This thing is pretty powerful and the battery lasts a long time. As far as headlamps, I'm gonna say my favorite headlamp is one like this. This is a Princeton Tech. This actually is not rechargeable. This takes AAA batteries. It drains through the batteries really fast. It's not very efficient. The only reason I like it is it's very lightweight. It's not too bright, but this is kind of like my go-to I'll use around the house. But if we're actually going like on a trip and I need more power and I need my battery lasts a little bit longer, I use another Olight. I think this is called like a pre-run. Uh, and these are really nice flashlights. Aaron and I both like using these ones. Another thing that we think is a necessity for living off grid is this. This is a Goal Zero. Yeti 150. And what this is, is like a portable power station. So a lot of times I will shut down the solar system or the inverter at night because believe it or not, even when you're not using anything in the cabin, it's still drawing a little bit of power so I can just save a little power that way. But if we wanna charge a laptop or charge a phone, anything like that, this is where this thing comes in handy. It has USB ports, it's got a regular plug and it's got a 12 volt socket. Another time we use this is if we're going on trips. So we gotta charge camera equipment 
phones, anything like that. So this thing gets a ton of use. We've had it for over four years. I have had to replace the battery inside here. I'm sure that there are updated newer versions of these that are more efficient and just work better. But this has been a pretty good key piece of equipment for us. One other thing we failed to mention up to this point was internet. So we get our internet service from our cell phone. We have great cell service up here. We use the mobile hotspot and that's all we've ever needed. And last but not least, we're going to talk about our laundry. So this is such an awesome machine. I'm sure you know I love it. This is a portable washer and spin dryer. We don't really have the space or the energy to have a full size washer and dryer. So this, this is what works for us. You could definitely go to a laundromat. In our situation, they're really, they're kind of just pretty far away to go to. So we prefer to do it at home. It's pretty small, but this thing cranks and I love it. The first two years we lived here, we were manually washing our clothes and I don't have anything positive to say about that. When I got this, I feel like my life was revolutionized. When I know there's laundry to be done, I'm actually pretty excited about doing it. So you wash over here on this side. This is the spin dryer. There's a little bit of a system I use to actually get the clothes pretty clean. The best part is the spin dryer. Before we were using a wringer and it was very hard to get a lot of the moisture out of our clothes. And not just that, it had a funky texture when it dried. This gets a lot of the water out. I can hang it up on the line that we have in our loft and it feels soft and just good once it dries nice and clean. This doesn't use that much energy. Eric will plug in the generator for me when it's a cloudy day, but if it's sunny or in the summer, I do not at all have to be plugged in. We can just run it off the solar system. It's compact, it's affordable, and it has lasted several years. Um, I anticipate it will last a lot longer. I love it. That's the last of our indoor tour. We're going to each mention our least and favorite part of our setup or living in a small space. My least favorite part is it's a thing, but it's also a noise. So when you hear this noise right here, that noise is our water tank running out and I just dread that sound. Ariel and I always joke that we could make that like an alarm clock tone or something and it would just wake us up. So water always runs out when you're using it, which is the most inconvenient time. That is my least favorite thing. And my favorite thing, I would think, it kind of ties into that is the way we live is so upgradable and we have all these choices to do different systems. And I think it's really fun to be able to kind of change things to meet our needs. My least favorite thing is definitely the food storage or the inability to store the types of food that I want. We garden quite a bit and I would just love to have those fresh vegetables in the winter. Right now we just have to can it all or preserve it. And a freeze dryer is just totally out of the question because of the energy needs. So we're kind of limited in that sense and that I guess bothers me. My favorite thing is actually the tininess of the house <laughs> and spending time with Eric. It puts us in a very close proximity and there are good and bad points to that. But honestly, it's just, I don't know. That's like my favorite part. I get to hang out with you. So. That's my answer. Overall, I think we're really happy with our setup. Uh, there are things that are inconvenient, definitely could be uh, probably improved. Yeah, that saves us time and money and keeps things simple and allows us to do things that we wanna do. Let's head outside yeah. and continue this tour. <laughs> well, it's a perfect day for a property tour. It is snowing out here. This is our main staging area. So it's like our driveway and our main area where we do everything and our property is a little over three and a half acres it's a rectangle shape so we've got a bog in the middle the bog is where we have bees and then in the back it's a really pretty forest back there we've gone back there and fell some trees and used those for projects around here it does back up to state land but we don't go back there that often because of the bog the bog is actually a wonderful area for the bees it works out great to have them out there they don't really bother us or anything like that because we're quite a bit further away from their hives and even though it's a bog and not very great for building on it is wonderful for wildlife so we get to see a lot of really cool birds out there in the spring and summer months when we first arrived at this property there was just the cabin and an outhouse and a pile of logs up front so everything else was gone there was nothing here uh, we have made quite a few little structures over the years we've put in and one of the biggest things eric and i did was add quite a bit of gravel we have 
spent a good amount of money on gra adding gravel because it really improves the land. Overall, this property does have really nice land, but when it comes to spring breakup and all that snow just melts and the ground is also thawing, you get like just smushy, muddy ground. And that was really hard to do projects in, but that's not an issue anymore. Let's go over and check out the chicken coop. So this is the chicken coop and we built this the first spring we were here we wanted to get chickens right away we have about 20 birds or so right now we have had 50 we've had a lot of birds in here the run is fairly large i think it's probably a thousand square feet or so and the coop is a 10 by 10 open air style coop clearly it's filled with snow right now because it is winter the chickens do still come out and they get to go underneath the actual coop itself in a perfect world we would have a heated waterer but we just cannot supply that type of energy so we just come out and give them fresh water daily i can show you inside there's probably some girls laying in there so we had raised chickens prior to moving to alaska but we really hadn't been in a climate with this much snow so one of the perks of this coop is the underneath space when we built this coop we didn't know how useful this space was going to be but it is one of the chickens favorite hangout areas they also have two lean-tos but they the whole area pretty much just gets covered with snow in the winter so like i said this is their favorite spot they're all under there raising chickens off guard really isn't that tough we our biggest problem has probably been the cold in the winter but this winter has been so mild it hasn't really been an issue and these chickens have a spectacular summer we actually let them out quite a bit they go over to the compost pile they get to enjoy a bunch of salmon scraps veggie scraps and it's just an awesome summer for them moving on to the garden which doesn't look like much of a garden right now there's the most snow we've ever had in here so I don't know if that's four and a half or five feet, but there is soil underneath there with plants. We don't have a lot of perennials. We mostly do annual vegetables and flowers. That was also put in the first spring that we moved here. We just really like to grow as much food as we can of our own and this makes it happen. It's a pretty big space. I think it's close to 1500 square feet. We also have a really awesome high tunnel that helps us grow plants that need a little bit more heat. That's a 12 by 36 high tunnel, so pretty good space. Everything's protected by a four foot fence. And then we have poly wire that runs about nose level of a moose, specifically because moose are in the area and I'm sure they would love to get in here. We've never had an issue with that. The wire is electric. We have a electric fence charger. We've got a solar panel and then a little battery that we put out there in the summer months. We also have the same thing around the miniature fruit tree orchard area. This area occupies a large part of our property. I think ideally we would have it spaced out a little bit more. The plants are kind of cramped and everything's just really production based in there. We water everything by hand and we pull that water from the well. We have a setup for that that Eric is going to talk about later, but we also have a storage tank that we roll out in the summer months. It's 325 gallons. We fill it up and then we have water during the summer months for using for processing. Also for the garden, if I'm doing like seeds, I can fill up little watering cans and it's just really convenient water during those months. And something else we've been doing for the past couple of winters is using the high tunnel as storage during the winter. So we don't grow anything there in the winter months. It's, we just don't have enough light and there's also no supplemental heat. So it works as a storage area. We've got wheelbarrows, extra garden stuff, and even tires in there. This is a little orchard behind me that we put in two and a half years ago. I don't report on it very much because it is not doing very well, sadly. So fruit trees are a challenge in Alaska and they have been very challenging for me. One of the biggest struggles we have with this area is snow removal. So I have tried to remove the snow in the past around the fruit trees. But this year with the snowfall we've had, it just has not been realistic for me to get in there and I'm running out of places to push it and throw it. Eric and I have developed a pretty decent system to get rid of snow, but as we've added structures and equipment, it's become a little bit more challenging. Snow removal is just a must around here. And let's kind of talk about why you would want to remove snow. So if you don't remove snow, you're gonna end up with just little paths and stuff around your property. We remove it because we need to get our trucks in and out. We need to go to the store, we need to go get gas, we need to do anything we wanna do. So if we didn't remove our snow, we'd be kind of stuck here and we wouldn't want that. And behind me is kind of a good example of plowing snow. So when you plow snow, 
you quickly run out of room. So we've got a, a plow on our Polaris six-wheeler. I absolutely love using it. It's very effective, it's efficient, and it doesn't take that much energy. But as you can tell right here, I can no longer plow in this area. If I do, this is just gonna keep backing up, backing up, and we're not gonna be able to get into our woodshed anymore. So our system is pretty simple. It takes Errol and I, we always tackle snow removal together. I usually start with a shovel and I shovel stuff around the deck in areas that we can't really get into. Errol usually goes for the snow rake and she starts to get stuff off our roofs. And then she'll hop on the snow blower and I'll get on the plow. And the snow blower is absolutely awesome, especially for us. Our area is pretty small. And like I mentioned, we run out of room to plow the snow. So the snowblower can literally shoot the snow in any direction you want about 50 feet. It's only a certain width so it does take quite a while using a snowblower if you're going to be doing a big area. There's also all different kinds of options you could do. You could get a plow truck with like an eight foot plow on it and really make short work of things. You could even just pay someone to come and plow your property for you and I don't even think it's that unaffordable. We just choose to do it ourselves because we enjoy it and we also get to choose exactly where we're putting our snow. The snowblower though, going back to that, it's not absolutely perfect. Our property and the way it's set up, you do kind of run out of areas to throw the snow with it. So if you're doing like a big open area of the property, you're kind of gonna be throwing snow where you're gonna have to re-blow it again, if that makes any sense. Unfortunately, since we don't have that many areas to blow it, we blow a lot of it into the garden and the mini orchard. And it's kind of unfortunate because we add more snow to those areas. And when spring comes around, when you have these huge piles like here or in the garden, those are the places that keep the snow the longest and it's the last to melt there. And this is one of my favorite things on our property and that is our woodshed. So when we first moved here, there was, I'm gonna say there was nothing. There was a pallet with a little cover on it that held like maybe a, a week's worth of wood. So it wasn't much. First winter, we had all of our wood just under tarps right next to the house. It works, it's inconvenient, and you have no area that's out of the snow to split kindling. Second winter, same thing. We had it under tarps, just in a different area. And then after that, Ariel and I tackled building a woodshed. We built this one before we had the sawmill, so almost all the lumber on here was collected from the property, and it was cut or milled with a chainsaw mill. So this structure took a very long time to build. The whole thing is 12 feet by 24 feet, and I'm just gonna say right now, I don't know how we did it without having a woodshed. Let's check out the inside. You've probably heard me say it before, but I'm gonna start with one thing in this woodshed that I would totally do different, and we might change it in the future, you never know, and that is the rafters. This is one of the first things we've built after the chicken coop, and before that, we hadn't really built a lot, especially in a place that gets huge snow loads like this. We have chose two by fours for the rafters, which was just the wrong size to choose, and the only reason we did it was budget. We didn't have a lot of money to spend on this thing, and we were trying to be cheap. It does work. It functions perfectly as a woodshed, all we have to do though is a couple times a winter, we got to get up there and we got to get the snow off. You start getting a lot of snow on here, you can actually look and you'll see these two by fours starting to bow in the middle. All in all, this thing has just been absolutely awesome. You have this covered area out of the snow. We've had snow machines in here. We've had our Polaris in here. Right now we got the snow blower. I've got a stump where I can come out here and split kindling. I can split logs. We have a nice dry area to keep our wood. We estimate we can fit about eight cords of wood in here. And the cool part is we have a side over here and we have a side over there. When you're going through this side over here that's already ready to burn, if that side's not ready to burn, it gives you a year for that to kind of season. Typically we go through about four cords of wood. So if this thing is stuffed full, that's two years of wood for us. Something you might not think about is trash. So everyone produces trash, including us. We're, we try to be minimal on it, but we keep our trash cans over here out of the weather in the woodshed. And when these get full, we have a transfer station about 15 miles from here. It's as easy as grabbing these. You take them down there. That's that. It's pretty simple. We don't actually have like trash service in the area with garbage trucks, but we do use a burn barrel and we try to take care of cardboard and big items like that just by burning it. Our lifestyle in Alaska has led us to accumulate equipment, gear, whether that be snow machines, tools, anything like that. And being in a snowy climate, it makes sense to have covered storage. So this is our main covered storage right here. 
And this is what they call a Connex or a shipping container. These are used to ship supplies all over the world and they are very popular up here in Alaska. And this is kind of a different shipping container. This isn't your normal 20 foot shipping container. This actually used to be a 40 foot high cube, which is a lot taller. And the company we bought it from actually cut this thing in half and they put it in a custom roll up door. So not only do we have a door on this side that rolls up, we actually have a back door through the Connex. Inside the Connex, this is kind of like my little workshop and I'm out here quite a bit. It's not heated, so when it's negative 20 outside, it's negative 20 in here. This thing is absolutely awesome. I mean, it's weather tight. I've got all my stuff in here. We've got a lot of stuff kind of misorganized right now because we're in the middle of kind of like a move, but you name it, we got it in here. Fishing supplies, clothes that we don't want to keep in the house like for the summertime. We have bee and gardening equipment. I sharpen my chainsaws out here. We've got a lot of extra food and the food that is out here, all of it has to be food that can freeze. So we've had problems with things like in glass containers like vinegar pop open on us because they froze. We absolutely love this thing and we actually put an addition on it on the outside. So that's where our solar panels are mounted. This thing came in very handy for that. When you're in Alaska and there's not a lot of sun, you wanna get those solar panels up as high as you can get. So I believe the bottom of our first one is like eight feet and the top one's like closer to 13 feet. So it's a great place to mount our solar panels. And two summers ago, we built what we call the lean twos. So these were a huge undertaking for us. It was an absolutely huge project. The only thing we had going for us is we had the sawmill. The size of it over on this side is 12 feet of roofing. And then it goes the whole span of the 20 foot connex. We did overkill on the rafters. So we did true size two inch by eight inch rafters. And you can tell from the outside, we have a ton of snow on top of this thing. And it's not a concern. We don't ever have to remove the snow off of this. On this side over here, which is the 20 foot side, it's kind of like snow machines and things like that. What I like about it is you can drive through. So there's no wall on the back side. It's not 100% snowproof, but you can tell by our snow machines. I mean, unless it's really windy, you're not gonna get a lot of snow on your stuff. And then the other side is even bigger. Well, come on back into my favorite side and it is a little tight right now and it's usually a little tight in the winter season. It has just been dumping snow out for like weeks and I'm trying to keep everything in here. This side is the 12 foot roof and it goes the length of the Connex plus an extra 20 feet. So it's 40 feet long of covered storage. I absolutely love it under here. I can come in, there's no snow on the ground. So if I got to lay on the ground and get under a vehicle or whatever, it's not an issue. Obviously this isn't a heated area and it's not completely covered. So again, on those windy days when the snow's really whipping around, you can get a little bit of snow in here. The only thing that I would change about this structure and instead of the 12 foot roofing, I would probably go to 14 feet. When you pull like a full size truck in here or a boat, it gets a little bit tight. So that extra one foot on each side, I think would really help out. This summer was so rainy. I'm not joking, it rained like every single day. And that other side over there, the 20 foot section, we were under there all the time, processing fish, processing veggies, canning food. This thing has been awesome. And we actually keep our little generator over here now for charging up our house batteries. Right now, this is the generator we're using to charge up the house. It's efficient, it's quiet, and the way we have it set up, it's running really good. So this is a Honda 2000 generator. This is a little bit of an older model. One thing that we do have to do living in a cold climate is we have to put this insulated battery box over it when it starts getting cold and Honestly, with this thing, when it gets like under 20 degrees, it just doesn't run very good at all, unless you put this box on it. What I've also been doing this winter is I run a little extension cord since we're so close to the chicken coop over there, and I put on a little bit of light for them. The chickens seem to really enjoy it. Let's go check out the other end of this extension cord, and that's over where our batteries are. Obviously I haven't been in here a while. So this is the extension cord that comes out of the house. And this, we used to just plug into the generator right there. But I just run an extension cord across the property. It's kind of inconvenient. And I plug it in right here. And that goes into our inverter. And then from the inverter, since it's an inverter charger, that's what charges our batteries. And our batteries are outside in an insulated box. I actually don't even know if the insulation even does anything. It's not good for the batteries to keep them outside. In an ideal world, we'd keep these in a heated area. All we have to make sure to do is to keep these batteries fully charged. I would think if I got them dropped down really low and it got extremely cold, you could probably damage them. So let's check out the batteries. That's it. So we have four of these Trojan L16P batteries. These are six volt batteries. The only maintenance you have to do on them is you have to unscrew these little caps 
and you got to check the water level make sure the water is well above the little fins in there i don't know what it is but for me i've had to do like no maintenance to these batteries i think i've added water to them once maybe twice in four years so they've been working pretty good for us okay plug that back in this is the last structure that we have on our property and this is a shelter logic brand and they call it a garage in a box you might notice we have a tarp on it from the sun or maybe from the snow and the ice i'm not really sure but we had some wearing in the cover for this thing so we bought a 20 by 20 tarp and we threw that over hopefully it's going to extend the life a little bit for it being in alaska you do have problems with shipping things up here and i mentioned that because we priced out getting one of those new covers shipped up here and it was extremely expensive so we went with the tarp we have found that we like to remove snow from the top of it not only from the top of it but as you pull it down the top you end up with stuff like that but they're usually a lot taller so you have to remove it from the sides too because you can bend these things pretty easily we have used this thing for a lot of different stuff around here and primarily what it's used for right now is storage so that's the route we took this winter we had a lot of stuff like the scaffolding that we bought for a couple projects we have our tools i've got my welder a lot of jars we're keeping out here so just basically storage also Ariel did a nice organization of all of our chicken feed and she's got it in these nice bins so birds and the squirrels can't get to it. So we've been keeping that all in here this year. We've pretty much always had our freezer in here and this is our freezer. So I think we picked this one up from Costco like four years ago and it's a 14 cubic foot freezer. You may notice when I lifted the lid up, there's no light on and that's because this freezer is currently unplugged. That's one of the perks about being in Alaska in the winter time is you don't have to run your freezer if you're keeping it outside. So when it gets cold enough <laughs> that everything in here is gonna stay frozen, we unplug it, but come spring, we will have to plug this back into the solar system, but it works out pretty well. Spring and summer, the sun's shining, we got all kinds of power, even to power a big freezer like this one. Something else in here, which is permanent, is our well. So the well is a major part of living off grid. And we had the well drilled, and then Errol and I took on the project of putting in our own well pump. The well pump sits 100 feet down. It's a half horsepower pump, so it's not that big, and it's a 115 volt pump. But it is big enough where our solar system will not power this thing. So we have what we call our big generator over here. So this is a Kohler generator. We've had one issue with it ever, and that is it was an extreme cold, and we had a seal freeze on the crankcase, and it drained the oil out of it. So I had to bring it inside, thaw it out, put the seal back in, it's it's just been an awesome generator for us we put like one tank of gas in this thing in the fall and i think it holds three gallons maybe a little more and i'm pretty sure we don't have to fill this thing up again until spring this generator is strictly used for running that well pump and for some reason it always seems like we're running out of water in the house at night so we've got a nice light that i can plug into the generator while it's running and i can see what i'm doing out here usually the first thing i'll have to do is i'll have to take my propane torch and i'll have to hit this faucet right here there's a little like a uh, well right there and water always seems to freeze in there. So as soon as I thaw that out, I can hook up my hose. We got running water going into the house. That water is just strictly from the well. So there's no filter on it at all. When it comes to our drinking water, I've got a pretty cool little can filter that's meant for an RV. I'll put that on here and I'll fill up our seven gallon drinking water jugs. And as soon as I shut everything down, we don't want water freezing in the well. So 15 feet down on this well line, we have a little tiny hole that I drilled. And what happens when I turn off the well water is the water slowly drains down about 15 feet and goes out that little weep hole preventing freezing of our well line. Here we have a strictly summer portion to our water system. And what this is, is something that one of our friends built us and it's a portable pressure tank for our water system. And this allows us to hook a garden hose up to here. That way Ariel can actually turn the nozzle on and off. We're at the back of the house where our outhouse and shower is located. But first I wanted to mention something that we did this past year and that was reside the entire cabin. So that was a pretty big project for Eric and I to do. Like we said, when we moved in, it wasn't completely finished and that includes the exterior. So we knew that it needed to be done and we wrapped it. We put the new siding on, we painted it during the rainy summer and I think it looks spectacular and it's it's been holding up really well. So it looks awesome now. Right over here is our shower. And we also built this from sawmill lumber. I wanna say we built it 
a year ago or so going into that last winter and it has been amazing we have had a few different shower setups here one was pretty rough when we first got here it was like a ladder in a container the other one we had here that eric built was made from just recycled things we had around here it lasted for a few years wasn't very pretty this one is much prettier and it functions great we really have no issues showering outside in alaska i don't i don't know why but if you have hot running water especially because we're out here for short periods it's just not a problem at all for us one of the biggest drawbacks is probably that we can't take long showers so i know that in an ideal world we would both take very long showers out here with that water storage tank being limited indoors we tend to take really quick ones maybe only not even a couple minutes long and i know eric gets shorter showers than i do but it's awesome it's beautiful we love the clear panels on the top it lets the light through in the summer right now it's snowing so there's snow on top of it and I know I've said it before but we also have a portable little battery or rechargeable operated shower head and that is awesome we were gifted that from some folks that live up in the interior and they obviously know about off-grid living too that's really awesome when our window is frozen shut that can happen when it's really cold and we don't get the shower head out so you have this other little shower head and you can put it in a little pot of water and take a little low pressure shower that way this is our Alaskan outhouse. These are fairly common here. And I don't know why, but for Eric and I, it's just not, it's no big deal to have an outhouse. We don't, we don't mind trotting out here. It's not that far away from the cabin. It came when we purchased this place and it was built extremely strong. We've never had an issue needing to remove snow. Um, it's just built very well. We spruced it up a little bit this summer. We painted it, put a little moon shape in there. Originally it was located over there. We moved it because we have a shallow water table here. We had to design it a little bit differently. It's kind of like a composting outhouse, a true outhouse. You would just dig a hole in the ground, you know, whatever depth you want. And that's going to be the receptacle that the waste goes in and you just move the outhouse when it's full, dig a new hole and just repeat that process. We can't really do that here because of the land. So we built ours up off the ground and we have like a little container or big containment area. The theory when we built it was that half of it was going to be occupied. And when this side was full, we were going to slide the outhouse to the other side, give this area a break, let things break down for about two years. Meanwhile, this other side would be being occupied. But here's the thing, we haven't had to actually move it yet. So it's been three plus years. We haven't had any problems with it. We clearly haven't filled up one side of it yet. Eric and I never had any intentions to use the composted material in our garden we were just going to locate it somewhere else on the property but that's not an issue right now so we don't have to worry about it we haven't had to worry about anything with this outhouse it's awesome maintenance free very low cost what else can i say it is a beautiful outhouse we have not really had to worry about scent or anything like that every once in a while i will add some wood ash or some hay or straw I'll just spread it down there but Beyond that, it's it's really perfect. Well, that is gonna wrap up the cabin slash property tour. And I gotta say, this was kind of a cool, fun video for us to film. Let us know if there's something that we didn't cover or questions you guys have about the property or the cabin. I think I speak for both of us when I say that living here, we have kept our setup small. We have kept it budget friendly. It may be a little bit inconvenient and limiting at times, but it has allowed us to explore and experience Alaska. And I think it has allowed us to save and kind of allocate some of our finances towards bigger purchases or equipment. And some of you may already know, but if you don't, we are planning a big move this spring to our new property. We're excited, we're scared, we're looking forward to it. But this place here has been just an awesome cabin and property to live on for the past four years. That's it for today's video. We hope you enjoyed it. We're gonna head inside. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, it's like a...